that gold miners have never been so underpriced, both in relation to an ounce of gold and in relation to, let's say, GDX or XAU index compared to the S&P 500. It's the most undervalued asset category on the planet, as far as we're concerned. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter and your host for this conversation today. Really appreciate you joining us because we have an interesting guest, a first time guest joining us. It's Michael Oliver of MSA. And we're really looking forward to this discussion, or I'm really looking forward to this discussion because he does a lot of technical anal analysis, momentum analysis. And I'm curious. Uh, in particular, in, in regard to the gold price, of course, and uh, also how much momentum is left in the main markets. The S&P 500 is, is topping at 5150 or over 5150 right now. So I'm really curious how much momentum, how much steam is left in those markets. And uh, why did the market react so positively to seemingly negative CPI numbers? So really curious uh, what our guest has to say. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome him on the screen now. Michael, thank you so much for making the time. Welcome on SOAR Financially. Thanks, Kai, for inviting me. Absolutely. Yeah, no, Michael, really looking forward to this conversation. It's been a long time in the making. And uh, first time on the channel, and uh, maybe for my understanding as well, let, let's run through uh, maybe your background a little bit. And what, what is MSA? What, what do you stand for? And uh, how do you work? Uh, I, I started in the financial markets when gold was legalized in 1975. Uh, I was hired by EF Hutton in New York City, the headquarters commodity division. And head of the department I apprenticed under, but he was also chairman of the COMEX at that time. Again, the, the initial years of, and months of gold trading. Um, I stayed on the futures brokerage side until 1992, because in 1987, I caught the crash. And no, I didn't catch it in a big way, I, you know, but I caught it enough to teach me a lesson that something I did was right. And what I did to catch the crash in 87 was not look at the price action, but to measure monthly bars, S&P price, in their relationship to, meaning how much above or below on an oscillator, to the three-quarter moving average. Uh, it's sort of fairly long-term yardstick. And what I saw was not what you saw on the price chart. The price chart was this upward arcing action. You know, you, you could hardly draw a trend line because it, it steepened. <laughs> hmm. uh, but on momentum, it was a floor. Bang, 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 hitting the same level each time over a span of a year and a half or so. The same oscillator levels would occur. As soon as we changed quarters and got into October, November, December of 87, the new quarter of the three quarter average had moved up. Boom, we blew out the structure on momentum in the second week of October and we crashed right away. Literally within, there's a 35% drop, which is the, the normal definition of a crash in a matter of a week and a half. Um, I was a bit stunned, but not totally shocked because I, I got short of puts. Now, once I, I learned that, I, I spent the next five years still as a broker, um, futures broker, developing the methodology, applying it on different time scales in different markets. So I didn't just look at long term, but I'd look at intermediate term, short term and all that. And those can sometimes be different. You can have a market that's in an intermediate upside, but it's in a long term downtrend, if you get what I mean. Anyway, in 1992, we started MSA. Uh, our primary customers were major institutions, banks, uh, a large uh, fund, a huge billion dollar fund uh, for timing research to them. And then in 2015, we opened up to retail subscribers. Um, we analyze all four major asset categories. That would be the stock markets, bond markets, commodities, emphasis on gold and silver, and foreign exchange. And I say right now, especially in all the years I've been looking at things, the correlation between those tectonic plates, stock market movement, bond market movement, is greater than it's probably ever been. So if you're looking at one market, let's say you're a gold bug, uh, don't just look at gold. Watch the stock market. Watch the bond market. To some extent, watch the dollar index. Correlation there is not that great, by the way, between gold and the dollar index. But as those markets move, it's going to impact gold even more. But gold doesn't always wait for events to happen or a headline report to come out, a CPI or PPI to say, oh, now I can move. No, gold's been around longer than any of these markets. It's smart. It anticipates, the participants in gold anticipate events that later happen. So don't look for the excuse to explain 
why it's going a certain direction. It'll explain it to you later. Okay. <laughs> I think that's <laughs> hindsight what is always right 2020, there. of course. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, right now our focus is, is yes, it's on gold, silver, and the miners. And we think that silver and the miners, which have been lagged dogs to the mama market over the last three years where gold's held relatively sideways. And now, now of course, upside, they've drifted down. So it like, it's like they don't correlate to gold. Well, they do, but for, over history, silver and the gold and silver miners will tend to either outperform gold vastly sometimes or underperform it. Well, they've underperformed since mid 2020. They've been going down relative to gold. I think that's going to change. Um, Another thing to watch very carefully right now is the yes, like you mentioned, the stock market. The stock market, we turned negative on the uh, in terms of investment grade decision about being long or not being long in January of 2022. Now, since that time, the markets, S&P, NASDAQ, et cetera, all dropped fairly seriously into 2022 later in the year. And then they based and turned back up. And now very narrow measures of the market, S&P 500 because of certain front end loaded symbols, NASDAQ 100, even more so front end heavily weighted symbols, literally a handful of symbols have caused those two indices to exceed their 2022 highs. In the case of NASDAQ, its high was actually in late 2021 by about five or 6%. Most metrics of the stock market have not gotten back to the 2022 highs. Okay, forget that for the moment. The issue is when will the stock market turn down? Because I, I, I argue, MSA argues that when it turns down, all these data points that everybody's looking for to soften, to cause the Fed to soften, uh, will follow the stock market, not leave the stock market. That's usually the case. You go back and look at the top in 2000, look at the top in 2007. It was after those tops in the stock market that you suddenly got bad numbers. It said, oh, economy's weakening. Okay. And if you are counting on the Fed to soften, now they've already softened to the extent that they're not raising anymore. Okay, we know that. Okay, the only issue is the only debatable issue. When are they going to cut? Okay, and Powell keeps going sort of back and forth on when he's going to do that. And, you know, and now you get a number today that they, oh, well, they're not going to cut and all this stuff. When that stock market starts to weaken and you start getting those data points, the Fed will cut. They've already said they're ready to cut whenever they see it justified. <laughs> the problem is, if you go back and look at the 2000 top and the 2007 top, when the Fed started cutting, short the market. They... It's when they ended their rate rises and then started the cut that the market collapsed. So the assumption that if the Fed cuts, that's good for the market is not a valid historical assumption. It's totally wrong. Yeah. I'm, go- I'm going to jump in here, Michael, because I think that's a really, really important point and a question I've asked the last couple of guests on the program as well. Like, what is the signal of a Fed cutting? Like, what is the symbolicism here? It might even only be a quarter point, but uh, 25 basis points. But I think the sim- symbolism is, is extremely strong and, and exactly that, that's what I'm ex- expecting personally to happen as well. It's, it's a negative sign. It means the economy is weakening. Mm-hmm. We're, 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 this is the beginning of the end to be a little mm-hmm. dramatic here. But uh, that's sort of what you're explaining as well. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, when the Fed cuts, it means they're, they're nervous. I'm, I'm a libertarian author and uh, thinker. I think that way. I, I distrust the state particularly the central bank. Its history is limited. It only goes back like 100 years, okay, the the Federal Reserve. And invariably, there are boom-bust cycles caused by monetary expansion, lowering interest rates below a price their free market might not set. So in other words, lower than normal. They create boom-bust cycles. And invariably, they're lagged to reality, their own reality. In other words, uh, by the time they start cutting, it, the reality is already set to happen. And all of a sudden they have a bust and they have to panic and go the other way. Uh, I, I think also the Fed this time is, a, is, though they've not admitted it, take a look at a bond chart, T-bond futures or TLT, the ETF of uh, T-bond, long dated bonds. And look what happened last summer into October. Now we, we predefined the event as a nuke event, meaning we thought that T-bonds were gonna crash. And they did. Between August, September, and October of last year, they really went down precipitously, almost like some commodity market that was limit down type of thing. Uh, And they went down more so 
than other bond markets, including private credit markets. They declined too in price up in yields, but the T-bonds were down worse. Now, the long end of the debt market is not the end of the market that the Fed has the best control over. And so when it got out of control last year, I think that put a spook up their backbone. I think it spooked them. And um, it, it demonstrated, one, they're not in control of that market, which they, they need to be. And two, uh, it's, it, could, it could get out of control in terms of its real world impact on the housing market, other markets, uh, resident, uh, commercial real estate and so forth. And there's all kinds of problems related to that that the Fed knows about but can't talk about. Like CalPERS, for example, you know the, the retirement fund in California, they have like I understand like a seventeen percent exposure. And I think it was even leveraged to some extent in commercial real estate, and so all of a sudden they're hurting like heck. Well, I mean that's beyond government as such, but it's the kind of event that if you start getting those kind of headlines, not not a bank related headline, but a retirement fund, what does that do to the general public? It creates panic. I mean, you know, I'm not getting my normal increase in my pension fund to pay out because, uh, to keep up with inflation because they're hurting. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nightmare for the Fed. They know it. They're aware of it. My, Michael, I wrote a question down, which is really fitting here. And, and the question is on the real estate crisis that you've mentioned is, is the market ignoring it or is it priced in? It's sort of ten, like touching what you mentioned right there. It's like, because um, I'm looking at the S&P, it seems like very worry free, you know, no problems inside. Everything's yeah. fine. We're rallying. We're up 30, 32 percent since October. Everybody's yeah, happy. Yeah. Right. Um, but then you're mentioning the, the the real estate sector, commercial real estate in particular, and it's <laughs> not looking honky dory. Yeah. Right. It's the opposite. So yeah. the question is, like, why is the market ignoring it or is it priced in? Like, that's like <laughs> markets start rational all the time. Yeah. Markets are, are not don't behave in an orderly, non-emotional manner. And if you go back to 2007, I suggest to your, to your viewers, and if they can get some charts, look at the S&P 500 in the summer and fall of 2007. Remember the Fed cut rates for the first time in years. In mid-September 2007, about four weeks later, there was a, the rally ended, that was the top. <laughs> Fed cut rates for the next few years, market collapsed. Okay, forgetting that, back then when the S&P rallied for that final high, if you looked at certain other markets, real estate related, financial related, they weren't making new highs. In fact, some of them were, were in a sharp down. So just like today, we have not, not residential real estate like back then, the mortgage market, but commercial real estate in an implosive situation, and yet the market's ignoring it. Well, it did the same thing back in 2007, and it finally snapped and paid its dues and caught up with the implosion that was going on in the real estate market. So that's a good comparison. Uh, yes, markets can ignore stuff like that, but it doesn't mean those things aren't valid and aren't potent. No, absolutely. That, that was a fantastic intro. You mentioned so many topics I want to dive a little deeper on, and uh, maybe we can break it down in stocks, bonds, and uh, as you said, commodities. And uh, FX, we don't need to talk too much about. I'm just curious about the gold Dixie relationship that you mentioned, the, the dollar index. Um, we, we'll, we'll touch on that when we maybe come to come to gold, because I'm uh, curious why, there, why you don't see that uh, cor correlation or why that has been broken up as well. But uh, l l let's start with stocks. And uh, I, I mentioned in my intro, like how, how much steam is left uh, like in, on, on the steam engine here that is, you know, just blowing up here. It's like we're at massive <laughs> melt up. We're at 5150 um, as we're speaking. No end in sight. Um, you well, you said it's quite concentrated, stuff. right? So like seemingly no end in sight, Michael. Yeah. But uh, like how much steam is left? I don't think there's much, if any. Uh, now, what we do is when we define momentum trend structures, it's it's the same as a price chart analyst technician drawing lines on his price chart. You know, if you, if you have a if you have a stock or, a, or an index that keeps coming down to the same price and holding at a given level, that's called a floor, right? Okay, and if you break it, therefore it's negative. Okay, or if maybe you have an uptrend on price where it hits this trend line two, three, four times, and if you break it, therefore it's negative. Well, when we look at momentum, we see something different than when we look at price. Price has this upward action since October. This is October, November, December, January, February, March. Okay, now marginal new highs in March. So it's like five, six months of, of rally. When you look at momentum of, of price, measuring, for example, the monthly price action of the S&P and its relationship to its three-month moving average. 
-hmm. Okay. And you plot the oscillator. You don't see an uptrend. You see floor. December low, January low, February low, and now early March low, all at the same level on the momentum chart. So, you know, if it were a price chart and you were looking at it, you'd say, oh, my gosh, where do I break it? Well, I'll tell you where you break it. Around 50, uh, excuse me, we're 15, what would you say our price is now? 50? Uh, 5148. 5148, <laughs> okay. About a percent to 2% under there, S&P blows that floor. Now, when you look at a price chart, you say, well, gee, dropping back to 100 points under here or 75 under here, that doesn't break anything on price. But on momentum, it blows this massive floor. On the NASDAQ, it's, it's right around or just below today's traded low. You better not close a day there. So in other words, if we see the S&P start to ooze on down later today and tomorrow, much below today's low, and NASDAQ do the same, NASDAQ 100, assume that the monthly momentum topping process, and it's a pretty good size metric. In other words, when it breaks, it tends to go in the new direction for a handful of months. You can't afford that because when I go to larger scale yardsticks of the momentum trend measure of the stock market, like quarterly momentum or annual momentum, you can't afford a five to 10% drop because you'll blow structures on those momentum charts indicating we're fully resuming what started in early 2022. Also, if you go back and look at the 2000 top, MSA turned negative in January of 2000 and we cautioned, we said, but be careful, you know, it could wander sideways for a while because we saw some reasons it might. And it even made a new high in August of 2000 above and beyond where we said sell it. And in 2007, we had predicted in 2006, the high would likely be between 1550 and 1600. Well, it took all during 2007, it, it sort of went sideways. And then finally, with the Fed rate cut, it popped up into that zone and broke out on a price chart. Momentum was laughing at it. No breakout on momentum. But price said, oh, look at me. As soon as you started the rollover and got into early 2008, you blew all these structures and it didn't take much of a price drop to do it. What happened? A massive bear market. We have the same situation now where you can't really afford to knock the little domino over because there's some bigger dominoes that will topple and the thing will cascade. So I'd say right now, if you're along the stock market, you don't want it to drop 1% right now. <laughs> <laughs> where, where, where do you see the next floor then like where, where's the next like sort of line of support and uh, i've had david hunter on yesterday and uh, he, he predicts like 20 to 40 percent drop in a bust scenario here so i'm curious like what your what the technical analyst says like theory versus uh, what do you call it practical i think you can uh, get about when you break these monthly numbers that i, that I mentioned that are right below today's level not far mm -hmm. The likely percentage consequent drop, the, the, and not the end of the move, just the next phase of the drop is likely to be about 10%. We've got various reasons. I measured both NASDAQ and S&P, and I come up with uh, about 9.5% level on the S&P where I see potential momentum support. You don't see it on price chart. And potential momentum bounce point for the NASDAQ. Not a major buy, just a point where there should be enough support to sort of halt the decline for a bit maybe get you a bounce. But I think the process, once you break the numbers I specified, just below today's low, for example, on a close, the process is beginning. And it'll, the, those who fear a crash event, you know, a lot of people think, oh, if it crashes, gold will crash. Well, that's not true historically. There's like one time in history where you can connect that. You go back to 87 crash, gold shot up big during that crash, okay? It's only in that uh, October 2008 event where in the middle of its bear market in stocks, there was a month where you dropped drastically and gold happened to participate for that month and then immediately shot back up to the highs. So as far as a crash event, I think you're going to have to get the S&P. I'll give you a, a number and there's a rationale for it, mo annual momentum. You don't want to see 4,305, 4,305 on the S&P. You don't even want to touch it. Now you say, well, that's 12 points below you. Well, yeah, that's a small double digit percent. You don't have to drop 30% to get there. You break that level and you could get a crash like event. Now, and when you look back to October, the low then was I think 4,100. So you're not even breaking that price low, but I'm saying if you get there on momentum, you're blowing out a floor that goes back three years.
okay? And, and therefore you could get horrendous drop. Again, what's the importance of this if you're in gold? It's likely to trigger a cascading data points that the Fed will definitely respond to and aggressively, and they'll flip and they'll go the other way. So will other major central banks. So monetary fluidity will again return uh, happy times, uh, you know, and, and, but it won't help the stock market. It didn't in 2000 to 2002, didn't from 2008 to 2009, and it won't help this time. Michael, you said something really interesting at the beginning is the correlations and you brought up gold yet again. And I'm curious, like I, I brought up CPI. I know there's a short term data point here, but I'm curious, like, because CPI jumped up, everybody would have expected, OK, that might mean the Fed could potentially raise uh, rates again, but the market rallied. All the other asset classes rallied, actually all touched uh, all no, new, uh, new all time highs like the S&P, as I mentioned, but Bitcoin mm -hmm. also gold really jumped up as well. But um, why is that? It seems like that correlation seems to be broken because everybody would have assumed higher CPI reading means the market is taking a pause here, at least, or yeah. a slight correction. But the opposite happened. Is, well, is, is there an explanation for that? I think it's one of the, I think it's partly emotion. Uh, we also know it's a very narrow, narrow. It's probably the narrowest leadership the stock market has ever had in terms of you could probably circle. You know, they call it the magnificent seven. Now it's down to about the magnificent two or three. Like Apple's broken stuff, you know, it's not looking good. It used to be, it mattered. Now it doesn't. Suddenly, NVIDIA is all that matters. But even NVIDIA is having technical problems now. Mm -hmm. So it's it's largely emotion because if if you're a potential, especially for your young investor with not much experience, all you see is it's going up and you're making money. Okay. And if the bad news comes in and you think, oh, that should be negative because the Fed's not going to lower rates or they might even raise rates or something. That should cause the market to go down. But when it doesn't go down, you say, see, this market's so strong, it doesn't matter. It's got a life of its own. And so you begin to get delusional. In other words, you separate the Fed reality from the market reality and think the market somehow doesn't matter what happens. It's going up forever. Okay. So that type of craziness is not uncommon at tops. <laughs> Well, back, sounds back, awfully back familiar, I have to, I have to the, say. The term, the term we use now, soft landing, that was coined back in 2000 in a Wall Street yeah. Journal article. <laughs> yeah. Well, do, do you believe in a soft landing scenario then? Like, since you brought no, that up, let, no. let's stay on that topic. Like, How do you think this is going to play out? Like We talked about, of course, you know, correction, 12% correction and potential sure. crash if the levels don't hold. So I'm curious, like, what, what does that actually mean for the overall economy then as well Like in, in that context? I think it's going to be far worse than a recession. Okay. Now here's, here's a, a, a broad reason for it. The boom bust cycles created by the Fed. If you go back and look at, oh, 1992, 93, 94, and look at the Fed funds rate, it was the lowest it had been in 25 years. The Fed took it down to a very low level, meaning they, because they're gods over the pricing of money rather than, you know, the, if we had a government monopoly over the pricing of beef, you know, it'd be like Soviet Union where people lined up at a shop to get their beef. Well, anyway, so we have a, a body of men and women, academicians, telling us what the price of an essential commodity is, you know, what's interest rate. Uh, and instead of letting the market determine the price of money, the, the cost of money, the interest rate, they do it. And they do it with their extreme wisdom. OK, well, in 92 to 94, stock market was laboring, in fact, under some pressure in 94. Uh, we were, had been in business two years at that point. We put out a report late 94, later in early 95, said the market's going to explode. The low cost of money for those number of years helped create the engine that drove the market to its 2000 high. Yeah, it was led by dot com. So it was a new technical phenomenon, you know, a new uh, man is going to be greatly benefited by the internet. And boy, they were right. They were right more than they thought. And yet, when the dot com bubble broke, it went down 82%. NASDAQ 100 did between 2000, 2002, but the fed lowered money off the page. It's like getting uh, drugs in your arm injected and you're happy. Okay. So you go out and you spend that money. Well, the market reflected it and basically what uh, double tripled in price from 94 to 2000. And then it topped in 2000 and it collapsed 50% in the S and P 82 and percent in the NASDAQ 100. Go back then to what happened in the 2002 low, bear market low, the Fed had been cutting rates all the way down drastically. They kept them down there and for a couple of years and it caused the stock market to rally to its 2007 high and help create the real estate bubble. 
the inflow of free money during that period. And the Fed finally later, later in that cycle started to tighten. But initially they created enough, uh, the, the Fed funds rate at that time was lower than it had been in 50 years. Okay. If you look at a Fed fund rate going back a long time. So you gave an infusion to the market and created a bubble. But in price, that bubble really only about doubled for the S&P. This time, they kept money at the lowest rate in like 75 years, almost never before, you know, zero rates, okay, with one blip up and then back down to the zero rate for a span of like seven, eight, nine years. And so that's like a drug infusion to investors that money's free, it's going to stay free, make your decisions based on free money, okay? And if let's say you were a young guy just out of college and you're, you're the head of uh, you're appointed the head of the business aspect of some company, you know, you the controller or whatever. So you help make business decisions, commitments of capital. Do we expand the factory? Do we not? You know, how much how much can we do? Uh, your assumption is uh, free money can't stay free for long. This is ridiculous. But then after a while, it stayed there. <laughs> and so pretty soon you begin to doubt your own wisdom. And you said, no, nah, it's going to stay free forever. So people. Families, corporations, municipal governments, state governments, federal governments made commitments of capital based on assumptions about the price of money, which is like an essential brick in any decision process. And then it was wrong. Suddenly rates are jump up huge compared to where they were. So suddenly you rip off the drug infusion into the arm of the economy and you have all these events underneath the surface that have been distorted. Once they come undone, it's not just the stock market, it's family decisions about whether we should buy a bigger home. And they did. And all of a sudden they're hurt on the mortgage, you know, et cetera. It's micro and macro events that you can hardly define. There's so many of them and they start to come undone and you have this market implosion. So it's not just going to be the stock market. It's going to be personal pain because so many people made errors that it's going to hurt. Now, whether you want to call that a depression or not, I don't know. But I think it's going to be very bad because of the nature of what preceded this top. No, exactly. Like what's worse than a recession is a depression, of course, based on definition, right? Yeah. Um, so, so I'm curious, like what, what are what indicators are you looking for? Like where are you seeing, like if you open the newspaper in the morning, like no. what is the first thing you look for, right? So I, look, um, I really don't look at the data points. The data points will follow reality, not lead it. Already we see, though, in any employment numbers, they're a joke. I mean, if you really take them and look through the categories of who got hired in what category, were they full time or were they part time, et cetera, it, it's front end loaded with government jobs, exactly. home care workers for elder for the elderly, uh, restaurant waiters, uh, bartenders, you know, not not industry, hmm. you know, not what you call the core of the economy. That's not where jobs are being created. And a lot of the jobs are temporary. So even the job numbers, which look good on the surface, you know, oh, wow, look at that, you know, so it's, it's heavily distorted. So I don't look at those to lead the market. Those will follow in the wake. The stock market, therefore, its breakdown will, will likely proceed by months, uh, a sudden change in the data points. So people say, gee, I didn't realize that. Well, you know, and meanwhile, the S&P is at 3,900 or something, you know, <laughs> before you realize it. Uh, so I don't look at those data points. Okay. So, so what's a leading indicator that you're looking at then, Michael? Like, let, let's play, let's turn this around. Like, what are you looking at that could sort of predict the next move up or down? I think the next move up and down is at hand. Gold has already made the statement. Okay, gold has roared up through the highs. Now, every time gold makes a new high over the last couple of years, even the gold bulls say, ah, don't trust it. Sure enough, it pulled back. You know? that, that's now exactly what I just said 20 minutes ago to somebody. Yeah. The, the problem is that they don't realize that they've been caught in a abnormal range of action for at least since 2020 highs in gold, silver, and the miners, especially in silver and gold. In the, in the, the range of price action is very narrow. And what you consider to be overbought now using some metric that's popular, let's say RSI or MACD, is only overbought based on the the behavior of the market over recent years, which has been unduly subdued. Uh, you get a logarithmic chart of gold or silver, go back 50 years and look at the last three years, and it's like a clump of ink. There's hardly any inhale or exhale. Yeah, you look inside of it, you can see some, but it's really narrow movement of price. 
And so all of the metrics that say this is overbought market, sell it. <clears throat> those have worked for the last couple of years. But we say that when gold got up through the 2100 level two weeks ago, we wanted it over 2118 on a weekly close. It did it close well above there two weeks ago. That was its breakout on some long term metrics that say, OK, game changing. Silver is now trading at levels that if it closes a month anywhere around today's high, its annual momentum says I'm launching. When you look at a price chart of silver, you don't see any particular level that says, oh, I'm, I'm going to launch. When you look at annual momentum, it's a perfect ceiling. It's been hit and hit mm. and hit and hit. Very shallow level. So when you look at momentum, you see a structure that, gee, if that comes out, we're going to go up. And it will. The tone of the market will change. It's already beginning to. You can see how silver is behaving the last few days, especially. And the miners will change. Uh, they're in the same technical position as silver. So we think they're about to shift. Okay, let's shift to another market. We know the dollar is weakening. Okay, uh, there's some levels below, basically under the 100 dollar, uh, 100 point level on the dollar index. Right now, it's trading 102, 103. It's laboring around for the last year and a half, really, in a narrow range. You break that, and dollar is going to start to move precipitously to the downside. This is based on annual momentum. The T bond market. T bond markets are the you know the 60 40 ratio the popular orthodox method of portfolio arrangement, 60% stocks, 40% bonds, did not help you in 2022. In fact, you got killed more in the bond market percent-wise that year than you did even in the stock market. So that, that mix, that supposedly balanced mix did not help. However, the technicals and bonds have now shifted away from stocks. So that if the bond market moves up in price, meaning the yields drop, it's, it's inverse to the stock market. It's behaving inverse to the stock market now. And it's behaving more almost on a week by week basis to gold. Now, right now it's lag. Gold broke out over a lot of stuff a couple of weeks ago. T-bonds are, are boiling just below a level that, for instance, the front month T-bond futures are trading just below 120 right now. They had a drop today. Okay. But they've been up in the 121, 122. If you're up the 122 area starting next quarter, it's at three weeks away. Mm -hmm. You're going to start to break quarterly momentum out to the upside through a massive breakout level, indicating a very sharp change in the T-bond markets about to occur, meaning price up, yield down. That is occurring opposite to what we're seeing in the stock market, which has this floor underneath that if you break it, you're going to go down precipitously. Mm -hmm. Because of the ripeness of the structures in T-bonds, so many times you've hit it. This time, you're not going to stop. It's just a matter of getting above it. It's a couple points. S&P, same story. Like I said, you can't drop a percent. You're going to start the domino flow. When these start to shift, I think you're going to get a tonal change in all, all of those markets. I mean, the gold's going to go up more dramatically, silver and miners as well. T-bonds are suddenly going to wake up. And the portfolio managers who might want to go back to the orthodox portfolio and put some more T-bonds in their portfolio and lessen their stock position, will have a sense that it's safe enough to do so because they see the behavior on the price charts even. And I know there's enough large portfolio managers out there. We, can, we know their names because they make comments that are skeptical <laughs> about the stock market. Yet they have to participate because if they don't participate in the long side, then they get their pants beat off by their peers and they lose investors and they go to the guy who's winning money in the market. So they have to play the game, but they're still suspicious. You give them the least reason, technical justification, like a sudden 5% drop in the S&P, suddenly bonds break out over certain levels. And they're going to have some justification to make that portfolio shift, less, less in their stock position, increase their bond position. And some of them are already making the commitment to go into gold miners. We've had some headlines in that regard in the past month or so. Uh, and those guys right now are making money because when they went in several weeks ago, gold miners have shot up pretty good since February low. In fact, gold miners have shot up twice as much on a percent basis from the February low as gold has come off of its February low. But anyway, so all these asset categories are at starting gates or in case of gold through the starting gate. And I think when they snap those gates open, you're going to start getting gushing action on the other side of the gates. You, you mentioned a couple of things I, I need to follow up on. Also, from my understanding, um, my, Michael, is you, the correlation of Dixie and gold uh, and the dollar and gold in that regard. 
Um, what you just mentioned sounds like there is still a correlation. So you mentioned if gold goes, yeah. uh, sorry, if uh, the Dixie falls below 100, you know, all bets are off. Gold will rally more or less. To summarize, it'll help. Right? Gold. It will. It will help exactly, and that's sort of what we're seeing. Dixie is stronger today. Gold is down a little bit. Yeah. So there, there is that correlation. There's a correlation. Normalized. Right. For the for the last year and a half or so, there's been a good inverse correlation between the dollar index and gold. Opposites. Okay, I'll give you that. But when you go back to the gold's bear low, it was in December of 2015, at a price of 1,046. Okay, so 1,050. Go back to December of 2015 on the dollar index, and you know where it was? Around 97. Okay. So what is it? It's now been you know. Uh, nearly a decade, and the dollar index is up, what, 5%, and gold's more than double? Okay, so if you only looked at the dollar index from a long-term point of view and said, well, gee, well, you know, the dollar index up 5%, gold's probably down over the last 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. But it's not a double, so it's not much of a help on the bigger picture. However, if you get some dynamics in the dollar, meaning you break something that causes it not just to ooze, but to actually push a bit, and we think those are just below the market, uh, that's when you'll get the dollar suddenly becoming wind at the back of gold again uh, because of the drama of what's going on in the dollar. No longer incremental, but noisy. Uh, I think that's about to happen. Yeah. Same question or similar question, actually, is like uh, gold and the bond market. It seems like they're, they're in, in, in a bust scenario, they would be going, uh, you know, Gold up, bond bond yields down, of course, but they would be going hand in hand together. Is that uh, a correct it assumption? They don't my correlate end? over long per term periods of time. But go back to 2000 when the stock market was topping. Punch up a gold chart. You'll see it was at major lows, making a bottom. Mm -hmm. 2000, 2002, stock market went down big. Gold went up big. Same period of time on T-bonds. T-bond yields dropped sharply. T-bond prices went up during 2000 to 2002. 2007, Fed cut rate in September of 2007, about four weeks before the top in October of 2007. Around October, quarterly momentum of T-bonds, which has the same setup it has now, where then it was a gradually downtrending line going back about two years, where you, you, you couldn't see it on the price chart of bonds, but on the momentum, you could see the structure. You broke through it around October of 2007, when the stock market was making its final high. And T-bonds started to dramatically rise. And they rose, uh, I think, for the next year plus sharply. So did gold at the same time that T-bond prices were rallying. So there was a correlation between price direction of gold and price direction of T-bonds back in 2000 and 2007 to 2008. And I think we're about to see that again. Uh, one, one question I didn't have on my radar, but uh, since, since you brought it up, is the quarter end, actually, and uh, the importance of that as well, because it is an tech, uh, important technical milestone, key point, I don't know, you, 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 you name it. But uh, for, for gold in particular, like um, I, I want to get a little bit more granular on gold here, trying to understand you know, the current move, but also like what, what is the level that it needs to hold to actually keep that momentum going that we're seeing right now? Well, gold's achieved it, and I, I, the only thing it, that hasn't happened is the gold miners, and we, we measure those like various indices, but, you know, focus mainly on, on GDX, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and silver. They have momentum structures on annual momentum, which is to say when you measure their monthly price action in relation to the 36-month moving average, which is a, you know, it's, it's a three-year average you adjust every month, okay? So it's a long-term moving average, and you plot price. Is it above it? Is it below it? You create an oscillator. This oscillator has a ceiling. In the case of GDX, the ceiling is precisely at the zero line, meaning every time GDX gets up to its 36 month average over the last two years, it's bumped it and pulled back, bumped it, pulled back, bumped it again. That number's up above 31 area. We get very specific in our reports. We traded up to the high 30s this week, okay? So it's just about a point above you, you're gonna engage that annual momentum with a massive breakout. The last time it had a similar pattern was in 2016 when gold and all the miners and silver exploded off the bare lows. Okay, big percent moves. Silver has the same pattern, except its ceiling is about 4 to 5% over its 36-month average. But nevertheless, it's a clear, definable ceiling. But again, if you were looking at the momentum chart, you'd say, oh, wow, that breaks out. It's a breakout. You don't see it on the price chart. The highs are fairly irregular on silver. So there's no good ceiling level. 
But on this momentum chart, you've traded up to that level this month. So you close the month out around the highs we've seen today and yesterday. Uh, it's breaking out. Uh, and I suspect you're going to get that. And so it, that's that's what we're looking at in terms of the engagement of this. Yeah. Gotcha. Michael, it would have been so great to have you on like a year ago because I really want to track sort of your, your forecast because it's, you know, it's like <sighs> – we're always doom and gloomy and uh, we're trying to be positive. I'm, I'm of course trying to be positive on gold, silver and the miners. Cause that's uh, how I make my bread and butter, of course. And that's where most of my portfolio mm -hmm. is parked. So just, just, just to track that, I'm curious, like maybe I'm not sure if it's an unfair question. I'm curious, like where did you flip um, or where did you turn from? I don't know, maybe neutral to a, a gold, silver and minor bull. If, if that's uh, a fair question, does that make sense? Yeah. We were bearish at the top in 2011 and 12. In fact, we got major bearish in January 2012. The high had been made in October 2011. Okay, so we get bearish a couple months off the high. What happened for the next year in gold was 2012 oscillated in a range, but could never get back to the 1920 price high that occurred in 2011. But it felt good for the longs. It felt like, hey, it's hanging in here. It's looking good. It was a laborious top after an aged bull market. In 2013, we crashed. After the 2015 low, gold was 1,050. At 1,140 in February of 2016, annual momentum had the same kind of ceiling that we've got right now on silver and gold miners. It broke through. We turned major bullish. Price of gold then was $1,140, so 90 bucks off its low. Nothing has changed the trend direction of annual momentum since then. Yes, we've had sharp pullbacks. But annual momentum has not broken its integrity. And now, in the case of silver and the miners, it's created a new secondary breakout level. It says, okay, after this uh, laborious pause that we've been in for the last three plus years, uh, we're going to re-engage that ongoing annual momentum trend. And I think we're at the door. Uh, but that's when we, so we've been bearish gold, we've been bullish gold. Uh, but right now, I think you've, the drama that we're about to see in the next year, I don't think it's going to take three years or anything. I think this coming 12 months is going to be very dramatic in major markets, one direction or the other way. And they'll be moving, like stock market will be moving opposite gold, opposite T-bonds. Uh, but the drama will be far more in terms of price dynamics than we're used to. And I don't think it's going to take years to reach these critical levels. Michael, I have two more questions for you. One is a community question, which I'm going to throw in here now. And the question is, do gold stocks go down when interest rates get dropped and the recession starts? Like, no, do you see a no. correlation there? Okay. The, 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 they'll correlate. They, they inhale and exhale more dramatically than gold. And right now, uh, we've said in recent reports, and this is a true statement, almost anybody can see it, look at the charts, that gold miners have never been so underpriced, both in relation to an ounce of gold and in relation to, let's say, GDX or XAU index compared to the S&P 500, it's the most undervalued asset category on the planet, <laughs> as far as we're concerned. And it's not going to zero. Yes, yeah, some miners might because they get taken over by some country. But basically, the mining sector is so undervalued that, you know, if you, if you didn't look at charts, but you only looked at underlying value, you'd say, you know, I don't care about timing. I got to own this thing. Its risk reward is too great. To, I got to participate in it. The, the the risk is trivial compared to the potential reward. You may not even have a sense of the timing. <laughs> I'm arguing now the timing is now, and I think some of these large asset managers, um, you know, like uh, who was it? Uh, was it Druck and Miller? Uh, yeah, Druck and Paul... Stanley Druck and Miller. Yeah, yeah. And, and he was followed by a couple others. I mean, you know, three or four weeks ago, suddenly openly committed. He was dumping a lot of tech stocks and putting them into gold miners. Yeah. Uh, Barrick by Newmont and Barrick, I believe. Barrick. So. Yeah, the, the blue chips. Uh, and you can see it reflected in the price action. In fact, after we bought it, it went down a bit, but then it's <laughs> exploded since. And I, it, I think it's a vastly oversold market. What do oversold markets do? If they're oversold and outsold, in other words, everybody who's going to be bearish is already short. Okay. <laughs> uh, when it goes up, there's no sellers. <laughs> there's a void. And I think we're literally at one of those points now where the volcano could erupt. And so on a percentage basis, if gold does what we argue it's already signaled that it's going to do, namely resumption, the miners will come out of this hole at a double or triple pace that the gold, as gold 
on a, on a percent gain basis. So I think it's a place to be primarily focused. Michael, you sound like you're going to be my new best friend, I have to admit. So <laughs> no, I was like, uh, I, I really hope you're right. And uh, of course, as, as I said, a lot of my portfolio is, uh, you know, in mining stocks and exploration companies, of course, mm -hmm. as well. I have one last question for you, Michael. You, you mentioned the GDX. One question popped up. Um, does that, like your thesis hold true also for the smaller companies? Do you see momentum built there as well? Or are they lagging yeah. behind? Do you see that yeah. lag effect? The, the junior miners, the little dime miners and stuff like that. Uh, they might lag a bit initially, but there'll be a point in this upturn, uh, in, let's say in the broader miners like Newmont and Barrick and then GDX, for example, then suddenly you'll see the juniors, the little micro juniors, go from 50 cents a share to $3 a share rapidly. So the percent gain that you'll see out of them. Now, the problem is the analysis of those symbols. Now, it, it largely could be simply emotion because when small investors want to get into a new sector, you know, they may not want to buy a $50 or $100 stock. They may rather buy a couple thousand shares of a dollar stock. And uh, it won't take much to move those, those symbols. Once you get the spigot turned on, and the way to turn the spigot on is to turn off the spigot on the stock market, mm -hmm. have some of that money flow out into other stocks. And it doesn't take much in a tiny sector like gold and silver miners to turn them into a wet bar of soap being grabbed by multiple hands, if you get my point. Uh, so it's, it's, it's almost not even a fundamental issue at that point. It becomes a technical issue of the nature of the sector is so small. Uh, and the juniors will at some point, yeah, get real hot, probably for the reasons I described. Okay. Yeah, let's just hope gold doesn't drop the soap, I have to admit. Um, <laughs> Based on that analogy, <laughs> um, I, I, I didn't expect to ask that question, Michael. It is my very last question. I do apologize okay. and I appreciate your time. Um, but I've been hearing, of course, Bitcoin has been taking a lot of the momentum yeah. from gold or the gold miners as well. So I do have to ask that. Is that real competition or is that something that should just yeah. work together hand in hand and will go up together it's, as it's we're sort of seeing right now? Yeah, well, we started analyzing Bitcoin when the futures came on board December 2017. We, and we can document, we've called all the major moves in Bitcoin, including get bearish off the, the 70,000 high, 55,000 get major bearish. In fact, we quoted in the Wall Street Journal that day. Uh, we got bullish in the high 20,000s, coming up off the 2022 lows, and remain bullish. But the people say, well, Bitcoin's beaten gold. Well, yes, it is over the last several months, percent-wise. But Bitcoin's gotten back to its 2022 highs. Gold's already been above that 2022 highs. So to some extent, Bitcoin's outpacing, but only catching back up to where gold was. But there's a fundamental problem with, with the cryptos. And it's, it's, it's a good idea. That the cryptos have a good solid idea in the sense that they're non-fiat currencies. And they can't be inflated by a central bank. Yeah, we can expand the quantity of Bitcoin and so forth in the mining process, but you can't suddenly double its quantity, you know, in a year. So its underlying real value in terms of the number of units, what they can buy, uh, is, is fairly stable in, in, the, in terms of the quantity of the money. So it's not susceptible to government frivolous moves. Okay, so that's a virtue. The problem is that if you start to undercut the potency of a central bank, by creating a money unit that is actually used in the purchase of goods and services. And I suggest you go on to Google and type in that, that issue. And you'll see there's some metrics that show many, many stores in the country, big name stores will accept crypto or Bitcoin. And the percentage use of Bitcoin in purchases like that is increasing and increasing. Some governments around the world ban it for that reason. But there's a point at which it threatens the power, the omnipotent, effectively, you know, martial power over the money unit that the central bank has. And so if you threaten the potency of their power, then their policy means less and less and less in terms of determining the quantity of money, the price of money, etc. Now, what are they going to do? Sit back and let that continue? Or will at some point they come in and say, well, you know, like they've already said, oh, it's used for laundering money and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's illegal and it's using energy uh, too much energy to mine the Bitcoin. So you know, they'll come up with something. But there's a point, a tipping point where too much Bitcoin is being used. And they say, OK, we got to stop this. And that's the vulnerability of the cryptos. And also they can be accessed better, more easily by the government. 
in your bank account and wherever it is, you know, electronic systems. You know, we've heard a lot about this. Yellen even yesterday sort of mumbled about, uh, I don't know anything about that stuff. Banks giving information to the central government on your purchases and sales of certain things. If they have certain letters in what you bought and sold, uh, the government wants to know. You know, <clears throat> so th that's a vulnerability of crypto. That gold doesn't have the same vulnerability. Well, you can really store it truly offline. So yeah. I guess that's uh, it's virtue. So fantastic. Awesome. Michael, phenomenal conversation. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, went way over my allotted time, which was fantastic. So, but uh, Michael, where can we find more of your work? Where can we follow you? Oliver MSA, MSA for Momentum Structural Analysis. Uh, go on there. Uh, you can see a picture of me and my son, uh, Brett. Uh, click under me. I got an email address. Request some sample copies. Be happy to send them to you. Uh, of our reports. Uh, also, if you explore on the site, you'll find more about why our methodology is what it is, how it, generally how it works, and a lot of archived reports where we call tops and bottoms in the stock market, for example, going back 20, 30 years. Uh, so anyway, explore around the site, and I think it'll be of interest to you. Fantastic. All of awesome. MSA. Really appreciate it. We'll, of course, link to it down below as well here in the comment, uh, in, in the in the description of this video, of course, as well. So, Michael, really, really appreciate it. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you joining us here for the entire conversation. What did you think of the conversation? What do you think? Where are things headed? How how, how strong is the momentum for gold right now? Um, how strong is the momentum for the S&P? Uh, what, what are you betting on? Are you long and short? Let us know. Also, let us know. What do you think of the conversation? Do you like the questions we ask? Like, please leave a comment, leave a like. And of course, if you haven't done so, please subscribe to this channel. It helps us reach a wider audience, helps us reach like-minded investors, and of course, spread the message and educate. That's the whole point of this channel. We do want to educate, making sure that you can make better investment decisions. Should you be long? Should you be short? Where should you be putting your money right now? Where is the momentum? Come back to the conversation here. Really appreciate you joining us. We'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you.